Hello and welcome. This is Lita Downs from the Center for Faculty Excellence, and I would like to welcome you to today's offering, Positive Communication, Strategies for Discussion and Disagreements. Our presenters, Melanie Brown, Tiana wells Heredat, and Emily Dolan, originally presented this offering at the Winter 2019 National Faculty Meeting in Tampa, Florida. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to them so they can introduce themselves with a short introduction. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you, Lita. Hi, everyone. I'm Melanie Brown. I direct the Academic Skills Center here at Walden. And Emily? Hey, everyone. My name is Emily Dolan. I'm the CAX Program Director within the Academic Skills Center at Walden. Tiana? Thanks, Emily. My name is Kiana wells Haradat. I'm the Executive Director of Regulatory Operations in the School of Nursing, and we have the great pleasure of pre presenting to you today. Next slide, please. All right. We're thrilled to be with you to bring this topic to our colleagues today, and I, again, have the great pleasure of presenting with my two amazingly smart and talented colleagues. But before we dive in, I'd like to quickly share what you can expect during this session today. We all work with peers, supervisors, and students who, let's say, challenge us to be our best. It's not always easy. And we've certainly engaged with colleagues where the project or initiative was engaging from start to finish and even concludes with a product that's far superior to where the way it would have been because the people involved created something dynamic with the very best elements from everyone and included the perspectives from the entire team. But that's perfect scenario, and it's not always that way. So Emily, Melanie, and I are excited to dig in and present to you a couple of practical examples and activities followed by some positive communication strategies and recommendations, some resources, tips and tricks for successful outcomes. Our goal is really to showcase how positive leadership strategies can be used to impact positive communications, even when the topics, the people, or the situations are challenging. Melanie, I'll pass the baton to you. Great, thank you, Kiana. Um, we'll talk today uh, in that agenda about the learning outcomes that we would like for you to achieve by listening to this session. Uh, we'll start out by defining our terms. We want to be sure that we're all on the same page. So we're going to define what we mean by communication in the positive leadership framework. Uh, we'll provide for you some of the contextual clues the factors you should look for that can affect conversations. By knowing these contextual factors in advance, you will have a pretty strong toolkit at the ready so that you can either prepare for a challenging conversation that you have scheduled, or you can fall back on those, um, that toolkit, those positive habits of mind, if a challenging conversation bubbles up unexpectedly in the middle of your day. We also want you to take away some specific strategies that you can use in those challenging conversations for responding in positive ways. And so we're going to share some scenarios uh, to help recommend ways that you can put those strategies into action. And then finally, we'll provide some Walden resources to help you deepen that, those positive communication skills that you learned today. I'll turn it over to Emily for our first scenario. All right. Thanks, Melanie. Opening scenario involves you being a Walden faculty member. In this scenario, you facilitate monthly program meetings with your colleagues to implement changes recommended by site visitors during your re recent academic program review. One of your colleagues has a lot of ideas and actions to take. Other colleagues who attend the meeting have complained privately to you that this person talks too often and seems to be grandstanding. In fact, some of the colleagues now just talk over this person, give curt responses, or avoid participating in the meetings altogether. The monthly meetings are crucial to keeping faculty engaged and keeping program development on track. You set up a Skype call with the colleague in question. So as the faculty member who leads the meetings, you may be feeling frustrated or concerned about how this other person who's in the meetings is not allowing others to give their ideas. So there are likely a lot of emotions going on in this scenario that you should be aware of. You may you don't know where the other person is coming from, and so next we'll give you their perspective. 
So the other person who others have accused of grandstanding is also a Walden faculty member. This person attends monthly program meetings with colleagues to implement changes recommended by site visitors during the recent APR. This person has been at Walden for a long time and they are very familiar with the program's strengths and weaknesses and they've participated in several APRs. Their colleagues are new to the APR process, so as a person who's been here for a while, this person feels obligated to take time to explain the points in detail. This person is excited to work with colleagues on this important, important initiative that everyone feels passionately about. Taking this context into consideration, it, it, in fact, this person is excited to work on APR. So as a leader of this group, you would want to try to harness that and perhaps give them some inside knowledge about the meeting. Say, hey, I'm, I know you're really excited to work on these initiatives, and so can you help me work on these initiatives by helping others to be feel involved in the process? You could also talk with this person about um, how they could interact with people offline and help bring them in and talk with them about being more involved in the APR process. These are just some suggestions of ways to interact with this person. So take a few minutes and think about how you would communicate with this person if you were the first faculty member and were in this situation. Melanie? Great, thanks, Emily. And so I had mentioned earlier that we want to define our terms. And we are talking today about positive communication. Now, when we say positive communication, it doesn't mean, of course, that problems or negativity disappear, right? There's always going to be negativity. There are always going to be problems. So when we talk about communicating positively, we don't mean just smiling through everything, ignoring any of the issues, or uh, we especially don't mean just telling everybody what they want to hear so that you don't create any tension. That's absolutely the opposite of how to solve issues that come up in different um, communications, such as the issue Emily just pointed out in the scenario before, where there's some tension in a group meeting that you as the leader need to resolve. But to go about resolving that tension, there are specific strategies you can follow, and I'll direct your attention to the top right corner of this box. Positive communication does mean that we need to engage with respect and take time to hear all sides. So now in the previous scenario that Emily was just discussing, um, you as the leader of that meeting have been hearing from faculty members on the side complaining about the person who's been dominating the conversation. So you're getting a lot of their perspective, and then you um, want to have the, uh, a conversation, of course, with the person uh, at issue here to hear that person's perspective as well. And when Emily shared that person's excitement and their experience with the uh, academic program review process, obviously they feel like they have a lot to bring to the table, and they do. And so now as the leader of that group, it's your job to kind of help negotiate and navigate so that all the voices are heard. So that's the first step in this positive communication. Make sure we're being respectful and we hear all sides uh, of the situation. Then if you look at the bottom right corner of that box, in positive communication, we all want to share with authenticity and demonstrate trust, right? We want to um, assume positive intentions, right? All of us have the good intention of wanting uh, Walden to succeed, of wanting our students to succeed, and wanting each other to succeed. But we all have different ways of going about making that happen. So we want to approach each other and be open to those conversations. And this is where, you know, you do share honestly, and, and you don't sugarcoat some of the tough truths, right? You know, I want to talk to you because, um, I feel like I'm, I'm hearing a lot from you and it's really exciting, you have a lot of ideas, but not a lot of people other than you are getting the chance to talk during these meetings. So what can we do? You know, and Emily had some great strategies uh, that this person could use in order to continue contributing, but without necessarily taking up a lot of time during the meeting with that one voice. Uh, so we want to share with authenticity and we want to trust each other. Being open to these conversations demonstrates trust. Um, both parties are vulnerable in this situation. You certainly don't want to go in um, focusing all on the negative. Um, and here we move into the bottom left corner of that box for another strategy. You want to offer constructive feedback and not focus only on negative issues. Uh, and I know we all know this, 
but it can be challenging without some repeated practice, making that uh, a kind of a habit. Um, we all tell each other to focus on the constructive, but in the moment of a challenging or a tense conversation, um, emotions can overtake us. It can be the easiest thing. You know, everybody wants to kind of run for the exit. Nobody wants to be in a difficult conversation for a long time. And so you might feel like, well, if I just address the problems and we get them out of the way, then I can hang up the phone and we're done. Um, while that is the most you know, shortest route to conclusion, it is not going to be the most successful one, right? Because you do want to um, hear all sides, share with trust and respect, and so go ahead and, and focus on what this person is doing that's positive, that does contribute to the conversation or to the good of the department, the good of the students in the classroom, um, while also recognizing, okay, with all that in mind, here are the issues we're having and, and we need to talk about ways to change that particular behavior. So keeping all of those strategies in mind, um, let's continue on. I'm going to turn it over to Kiana to talk about some of the contextual factors we mentioned earlier that go into some challenging conversations. Thanks, Melanie. It's certainly crucial that we share that positive communication, we share what it does and doesn't mean, that authenticity and creating trust and respect and constructive feedback are critical to uh, the success of positive communication. Now, in the opening scenario Emily presented, we witnessed an interaction where several very well-intentioned colleagues had differing perspectives, right? It led to actions that created conflict. But through the practice of positive communication, what we're encouraging is the continued practice of healthy behaviors. We're encouraging you to be mindful of the way that you initiate conversations, your body language, your tone, the way that you respond when the other person is talking. And this helps to shape the path that the conversation will take and the way that it will end. It's also critical that you're aware of the context that makes the situation unique. Maybe after a conversation that ended poorly, if you can think back in your analysis of what went wrong, um, you can probably think of an instance where the context really mattered. I bet you've had the experience, I know I have, where you're in a meeting and you can literally see or hear emotions escalating, or you've witnessed someone um, giving or on the giving or receiving end of a public admo admonishment and you cringe thinking, I really wish that that would have been done one-on-one -on -one instead of in this large group setting. We have to consider also the power differentials and not just between people and their direct supervisor, although I believe that to be the one that's most obvious, but also when people are interacting at varying levels. For example, your students interacting with faculty or managers that are interacting with vice presidents and how that might influence the way the information that one person is providing or receiving on the other end of that situation. Of course, it's also critical to do your best to begin the interaction so that you, such that you set yourself up for a positive two-way exchange. It's beneficial for everyone if the interaction takes place in an appropriate setting uh, without defensiveness, aggression, or one person shutting down completely if that doesn't help anything. So think about that for a moment. The setting matters, not just the words that you use, but the way that those words are spoken. So the practice of positive communication often requires some pre-planning when possible, and that you put things into practice and take your time. Next, we'll share several concrete tips and strategies for creating productive outcomes using positive communication. Thanks, Kiana. So as Kiana said, we do have some tips for you to have positive conversations. And the first is, if you're having a conversation online, make sure to use your web camera if at all possible. When you communicate in person, people can see how your face is, how your face looks and how you're reacting, and you can see how the other person is reacting. And when you're communicating via phone or via um, the computer without a, web, without a webcam, you lose a lot of that communication. And so if you can use a web camera, you get some of that communication back. And again, that can help you pace your communication, change tack if you need to, and just see how the other person with whom you're communicating is reacting to the things that you say. And they can see how you're delivering the message. Sometimes things can be taken out of context or can be um, taken in a way that isn't favorable if people can't see your face and see how you're really meaning to deliver the information. You also want to make sure that you're practicing active listening. A lot of you are probably familiar with active listening, but just as a reminder, active listening is when you're asking questions 
to the person and repeating information back to the speaker so that you really make sure that you're understanding what the speaker is saying. Sometimes when we get caught up in the moment or we're having an emotional conversation, we're just waiting to jump in with whatever we want to say next, and we're not really listening to the other person. So especially in emotionally charged situations, sometimes you can pull back some of the emotion by practicing active listening. And again, saying, is this what you, this is what I heard, this is what, is this what you meant to say, or is this um, what you meant me to hear? And asking follow-up questions so that the other person really knows that you're listening to what they're saying. By the same token, you also want to give that person a chance to explain their perspective and feelings. So if you're a leader and you're delivering information to someone else or you're having an emotionally charged conversation with someone else or giving them not so favorable news, you really want to make sure that the other person has a chance to explain what was going on from their side. So going back to that initial conversation, if you were the leader and had only and we're only coming from the leader's perspective where other people are complaining about the other faculty member, you may think, man, this faculty member is not, is just grandstanding, is running over other people. But when you hear the other person's side, they're really excited. to be part of the planning after the APR. So you do always want to give the other person a chance to explain their perspective and feelings because they may be coming from a place where that you had no idea or may have feelings that you had no idea about. You also want to be a card, meaning that you want to be clear, authentic, respectful, and direct. You never want to beat around the bush. You always want to be very clear with the person about what, whatever issue that you're talking about, and you want to be direct without being rude. You can be direct and clear without being mean or nasty to someone else. You can just remove the emotion from what you're saying and be very clear and give examples of the behavior. You also want to make sure that you're being authentic and respectful. People can tell when you're not being yourself or when you're trying to be um, someone else and you're not really delivering the information as a real person. So you want to make sure that you're being as authentic as you can be when you're in those situations. You also want to be respectful of the other person. This goes back to giving them a chance to explain their perspective and feelings. You want to make sure that you're giving them space to also be themselves and to give you an authentic reaction to whatever information you're giving them. Finally, you want to propose and agree on a resolution and next steps. And that actually brings me to the beta model. And if you've taken the LMAT training, you'll be familiar with the beta model, but I'm going to go over it again. So the beta model gives you a framework for difficult conversations, and some of which you can set up in advance if you're not surprised by a difficult conversation. So the BIDA in the beta model stands for behavior, impact, dialogue, and agree. So things that you can set up in advance are the behavior and the impact. So if you know you're going to have a difficult conversation with someone, you're going to write down, want to write down perhaps some talking points about what behavior is pro currently problematic. You, can, you want to be clear and you want to use simple language, but you also want to be specific when you speak to the person. Finally, you want to add explicit examples of when you've seen this behavior or when other people have seen this behavior come out so that someone can say, oh, that's when, uh, that's what happened here. You don't want to be vague. You want to give specific examples so, the, so that the person knows exactly what you're talking about. You also want to explain the impact of the behavior. So express the impact of the behavior on the organization, perhaps the team, or just an individual person. It could be all three of those, too. And again, you want to be direct but respectful. So you want to try to just talk about how the behavior is impacting people, not in a mean or derogatory way. Then you want to give the other person an opportunity to speak about how they feel the situation happened. So you, in this point, you want to acquire information. This is where you're going to want to use your active listening skills. You're also going to want to acknowledge the feelings of another person because they may be very, they may have some emotions attached to whatever is going on in the situation. And you also want to confirm accuracy and understanding. So you want to make sure that the other person understands where whomever has the concern is coming from. And you also want to make sure that you understand where the person 
when people have a concern about is coming from. Finally, you want to agree. And you may not always completely agree on what's happened, but you do want to come to some type of action plan. So you want to summarize your areas of agreement or perhaps disagreement, and then decide how everyone is going to move forward. Perhaps that the, the, the person is going to behave differently in the future. Perhaps meetings are going to be run differently. It really depends on what the situation is. This, this is a good point to send a follow-up email to the person with whom you've had the conversation, and you write out any areas of agreement or disagreement and your proposed action steps. And you also want to ask the person, do you have any, am I remembering this correctly? Am I writing this down correctly? So that person has a chance to come back to you and say either, yes, you did write this down correctly, or no, I felt like this is, we came to a different agreement. And then you get, a, get another opportunity to clarify. All right. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Emily. And we can jump right in here. So we had mentioned earlier that we'd give you some concrete strategies, specific practices that you can use in difficult conversations. And so now we have a few scenarios we want to share and talk about ways you can apply those specific strategies to these challenging conversations. So here in this first um, scenario, you are a Walden instructor. A student in your class plagiarizes discussion posts regularly. You've taken points off, you've noted it in your comments each time it happens, and suggested resources to help the student learn how to cite sources properly. After consulting with your coordinator, you decide to talk with the student over the phone to explain how to prevent plagiarism in future discussion posts. And so how can you respond in this telephone conversation with positive communication strategies? Well, first we want to acknowledge some of the emotions um, that could be prevalent in this perspective, in your perspective as a Walden instructor. Um, pointing out plagiarism takes time, right? And, and everybody's already busy, and grading takes a lot of time too. And so um, it takes extra time to note when plagiarism happens and to provide examples of how to avoid it, uh, to write out and explain instruction for how to, <clears throat> how to avoid that situation. So odds are that the instructor is feeling frustrated at having had to spend extra time on this and frustrated that the student seems to continue um, regardless of having had your comments and having had points taken off, the student seems to continue with this um, approach to writing in the discussion post. And probably as an instructor, you're feeling like you need to address this quickly because it's happening in discussion. So other students can read how this student um, is writing. And you know it's incorrect. It presents a negative role model in the class. Right, so it, you need really to correct this soon. So calling, a, a, asking for a phone conversation certainly makes sense. And so now let's take a look, because at this point you don't know the second perspective. Let's take a look at the student's perspective before we get into that telephone conversation. So now you're a Walden student. You're a single parent with a full-time job in your third term at Walden. You've always received A grades and never received negative feedback about your writing. Your instructor keeps telling you that you're plagiarizing in your discussion posts, but you don't understand. You're writing the same way that you've been writing since you started your program. You're angry and confused, and you think the instructor might be singling you out. So now if we think about the emotions of the student in this situation, um, the student is unclear why when they haven't done anything differently in their writing, the instructor keeps telling the student that the pro there's a problem. And the student, like you, feels pressed for time and potentially frustrated, you know, probably looking forward to the conversation to be able to clear it up. Um, but also, now this conversation takes time too, right? Away from school, away from family and work. Uh, and it's an additional thing to have to schedule into the day. Um, and so, and it also seems obviously the student has not made changes that you've pointed out. So when this conversation comes up by phone, 
Uh, you both have some common ground here. You're probably both frustrated and you're both short on time, right? So as the instructor who called the conversation, uh, some of the great comments we got when we gave this webinar live um, and, uh, at national faculty meeting and as a webinar uh, after that, uh, people focused on wanting to be uh, compassionate with the student you know, and courteous, right? Thank the student for taking the time to call, to have the conversation. And then follow Emily's beta model that she described a moment ago. Um, you want to be clear and use simple language and point out examples of the behavior that has been problematic. Um, you want to explain the impact of it on the class, right? The, the impact of, you know, this, is, this really is plagiarism and I'm really showing you in this teaching opportunity how to correct it so it doesn't affect you in this class moving forward or in other classes that you'll have after this one. And also I want to make sure that you're writing well because in discussion posts, you and all students are role models for each other. So I want you to model good writing behavior, good writing habits. Um, and certainly in the beta model, after behavior and impact, you have dialogue. You absolutely want to ask the student for their thoughts. And you don't want to talk for 15 minutes before you give the student a chance to talk, right? So not long after thanking the student for joining the conversation and letting the student know why you asked for this phone call, you go ahead and turn it over and say, you know, have you been receiving my comments? What did you think of those? And this is an opportunity for the student to be able to say early in the conversation, you know, I've never had negative feedback on my writing. And the student's probably going to ask the tough question, how come no one else pointed this out before, you know, and, and nobody know, don't know why other instructors haven't pointed it out, but, you know, you wanted to show it to the student so it doesn't affect them negatively moving forward. Um, and then finally, the A in the beta model is, as Emily said, to agree, to arrive at a conclusion and an action plan. And this likely will involve follow-up email where uh, you offer to take a look at a couple examples, ask the student to share some examples via email so that the next time before the student posts something public in the classroom, you feel confident that the student has learned even the basic skills of citation structure so that you, the student knows you'll be looking expressly for it in the next discussion post and you know that when the student goes into that next discussion post, they have that skill at hand. So those are some strategies I'd suggest for approaching this conversation. Now we'll turn over to the next scenario to Tiana. Thanks, Melanie. Consider the scenario. You're working with a Walden peer colleague from another department on a challenging project with tight deadlines and unknown variables. The team will update a leadership group that includes your supervisor. The day before the presentation, your peer emails you with some rather forceful statements demanding information ASAP or he or she won't commit to the deadline due to your refusal to provide the detail she or he needs. You've communicated on multiple occasions that the outstanding decisions are dependent upon several external, external factors that are out of everyone's control. So if you're the meeting organizer or leader in this scenario, you might be thinking that um, the, your colleague is being unreasonable. Maybe the, you believe the person to be um, unfair. Perhaps the, you believe the person hasn't been as engaged as they need to or else maybe they would know that you've talked lots of times about how a lot of the decisions that need to occur haven't occurred yet. Hence you and the team not being able to, to have the, um, all of the, the variables figured out such that you can present to this leadership group in the way that you might like to. Let's consider another perspective. All right, so if you're the colleague in this scenario, you might be thinking, you've been working with the, your other departments on this challenging project, and there are tight deadlines, and you know that there are unknown variables, but the team has to update the leadership team and your supervisor is engaged in that group too. And maybe you're feeling frustrated because it looks like the team may not meet the deadline and you want to be careful that the delay isn't blamed on you. So to help push the team forward, you decide that you want to help them make some decisions. So you send an email to the team and you think that you're being clear and you provide directives and highlight and bold and underline and you talk about the risks and the consequences. So again, as the second person, as the, the colleague or your peer in this scenario, perhaps you're feeling very anxious that the deadline might not be met. 
Um, you're also probably feeling like the team isn't moving as efficiently or as effectively as you would like for them to. And so this creates a, a scenario where there's likely a, a, a disconnect and there's probably some conflict. So just to share some of the recommendations that have been offered previously during national faculty meeting and some of the other presentations of positive communication, some of your colleagues shared that they would pick up the phone and speak with their colleague voice to voice and ask the person to explain their point of view. And using the, the beta model that Emily explained, they would listen respectfully without interrupting and allow the, the colleague to, to share their perspective and, and truly listen and be respectful to that person's perspective. We also talked about uh, considering engaging the colleague in the project more perhaps giving the colleague more responsibility. If you're the leader of the team, making that person feel like they are more engaged and included so that they can offer their expertise in a way that they feel like a, a true member of the team, that they are committed and engaged in a different way if, as if a, they are a partner with you as the, the leader of the team. Some other strategies we talked about making sure that the, the tone that you use when you're speaking with your colleague is respectful, that you don't make accusations, that you talk very specifically about how the behavior impacts their colleagues, that you don't blame, that you try to praise the person and talk about how grateful you are for your colleague's participation and their expertise. And then again, as Emily shared in the beta model, we would want to make sure that you're clear and specific about next steps and, and what will happen as a result of your conversation such that you're able to move on in a positive way. And next, Emily will share our final scenario. Thanks, Kiana. So in our final scenario, you are a Walden colleague. You've been leading a high-profile project for about a year. Here's to the grapevine that one of your colleagues is unhappy with your leadership and they think the project will fail. You've clearly communicated to everyone that you have an open door policy and that people should feel free to come directly with the, to you with concern. You're frustrated that your colleague decided to talk negatively about you behind your back, you and the project behind your back. So as a person leading the project, as this summary says, you feel frustrated and you're unhappy that this colleague is talking about you behind your back. So we'll get another perspective, but on the front end, this is a good opportunity to think about the beta model because you have an opportunity to think about your response prior to talking with this other person. So you might say, or you might write down some thoughts like, um, it frustrates me when I hear, or I heard that you've been saying negative things about me and this project that I've been working on behind my back. Um, that's very frustrating to me, especially because I've stated that I have an open door policy. It impacts me because I had to hear about this from someone else, so it makes me feel like you don't feel like you can come and talk with me. And has you saying negative things about the project without talking to me first has the potential to impact how others see the project um, without actually having heard about it or having, having interacted with it yet. So here's the other person's perspective. You are also a Walden colleague. You've worked in your organization for six years and you've seen many initiatives fail and you're somewhat despondent about your job and the organization in general. One colleague is working on a high-profile project. Generally, you like this person, but they haven't been around as long as you have, and this person seems to be falling into some of the pitfalls that you've seen other people fall into before. You casually talk with a few other team members about your concerns regarding the high-profile project, but you don't discuss it with your colleague who's leading it because he or she won't care, and you're tired of your job. Why bother putting in the energy? So you can see that once you get on the phone or once you get on a chat with this person, as the leader of the organization, you're going to find out that this person is not feeling very engaged with the organization. So other people have suggested maybe this is an opportunity to engage this person. You could ask this person's perspective about the project and see if they have any insights that you could use as the leader of this high-profile project. So while Again, I think it's still a good idea to come in with the beta model and have some behavioral and impact statements outlined. When you get to that discussion or that dialogue portion, you're going to find out that maybe this person just isn't engaged. But again, this is an you can see this as an opportunity to engage this person um, and get their perspective. And you can talk with them about, you know, you've been at this organization for longer than I have. 
what kinds of things do you think could be successful in leading this project, and what kinds of pitfalls do you see that I'm falling into? So you could, this is a real opportunity for you as a leader of this project to gain some insight and perhaps even a better strategy than what you had before. So this, again, starts off as frustrating but could be looked at as a, real, a really great opportunity to both engage this other person and improve the quality of the project that you're working on. All right, I'll turn it back Thank over you, to Emily. Melanie. Super. Thanks, Emily. Uh, and we want to thank all of you for viewing here. And we want to leave you, in addition to the uh, strategies we described earlier and examples of ways you could apply them in those scenarios that we shared with you, we also want to leave you with a few additional resources. Um, we recommend a couple of books about um, positive communication and, and uh, can give you even more strategies and application examples. One is called Crucial Conversations. Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High, and another is called Radical Candor. Those are both good books, um, and Radical Candor in particular has a podcast that uh, some of our colleagues recommend as well. So you can check out those resources. Uh, also, MyLearn has resources on active listening, uh, communication, and positive leadership, and you can always reach out uh, for more positive leadership support at the email address listed there, positiveleadershipaction at laureate.net. And that is a, um, an email account that Kiana and I uh, oversee. We're the only two people who answer uh, requests or questions in that email account, and so you're welcome to write to us directly via it with more questions about communication. We're happy to help.